Now the patient is, uh, has presented with uh, a fair amount of disease in the abdominal cavity and she has ascites. And the thought is, okay, so now we know that she's had this Q3 weekly schedule of paclitaxel in the frontline study with carboplatin and has developed this new disease which has been associated with ascites. And so our options now are to think about non-platinum-based um, regimens. And that's, um, although I don't like the term platinum-sensitive, platinum-resistant, I think what the, um, the point is is that the time frame for this disease to present the way it did would suggest that platinum probably is not going to be an effective agent uh, in and of itself. Um, and paclitaxel, although it was given before, um, has been used frequently in this case when it's been fractionated. So I mentioned uh, in an earlier segment that weekly paclitaxel uh, was shown to be beneficial, potentially even more beneficial than Q3 weekly paclitaxel in uh, the frontline setting. In the recurrent setting, it seems to have activity that's at least as good as some of the other non-platinum agents that would be appropriate for her. And there are many that, she, this would, that, she would, be that would be appropriate for her, including uh, liposomal doxorubicin, um, topotecan, uh, gemcitabine. Uh, sometimes I give that also in combination with um, uh, cisplatinum, and then paclitaxel. Uh, all of these would be reasonable options to give single agent. Now there was a large study, um, uh, actually it's, it was kind of the three randomized phase two type trials um, put into one called the phase three trial, uh, called the Aurelia trial. It was a very simple trial, open label, that randomized patients who had had uh, one or two prior therapies uh, and had had their first, their recurrence within that six month window that many people use to describe a platinum resistant patient. And it randomized them to a physician choice chemo versus that same chemo plus bevacizumab. And the trial was, um, uh, I think, uh, well conducted. It had three uh, chemotherapy cohorts to, to evaluate. And, um, but as an, an analysis of the trial overall, what, what the trial showed was that the addition of bevacizumab to any of the, of the chemotherapy um, regimens that were allowed under the physician's discretion uh, were, uh, be was better, more, uh, brought a longer progression-free survival, and in many cases, uh, better response rate. So um, in patients like this, who I think are good candidates uh, for that combination, any one of those chemotherapy backbones, whether it's uh, uh, topotecan in the number of schedules that it was given, liposomal doxorubicin, or paclitaxel administered weekly in combination with bevacizumab, is a reasonable option to give patients um, sometimes patients who have uh, paclitaxel frontline uh, have neuropathy and are not good candidates for paclitaxel um, in that setting, but that does allow us multiple other chemotherapy options to give in combination with bevacizumab. So I, would, I guess I would summarize that. I think that um, um, in a patient who can tolerate a, a drug combination such as paclitaxel and bevacizumab, uh, and especially in a patient who has ascites, that this is probably uh, the one of the best uh, or the one of the most biologically related uh, important therapies that we could give her. As you start any chemotherapy regimen, I think it's important to understand what the anticipated toxicities are. Um, since we have several uh, options in front of us, the different chemotherapy backbones can provide uh, different types of toxicities in front of the patient. For instance, Alopecia is something that most patients experience or expect, um, but as it turns out, a drug like liposomal doxorubicin doesn't really cause a lot of alopecia. So all, each of these drugs has their own little nuances. And of course, when you add a drug like bevacizumab, you're essentially adding another potential agent for toxicity. And then sometimes there's an interaction between the two. So um, I mentioned that uh, for paclitaxel, our major concerns are uh, issues like um, bone marrow suppression and neuropathy. Um, when we added bevacizumab to the regimen, we saw the addition of the bevacizumab-associated uh, toxicities. And there's been some concern that there may be an uh, increase in, uh, uh, in, some neuropathy, in some forms of neuropathy when the combination is given. Um, this, I think, still needs to be worked out in more detail, but it's just something to be aware of, and certainly we would be monitoring for that. We've had a lot of experience with bevacizumab as a single agent. I think many clinicians are quite familiar with the expected side effects such as hypertension, um, proteinuria, um, uh, potential for blood clot formation. Uh, and of course, there's some very serious side effects such as bowel perforation, a fistula, and um, uh, the um, uh, CNS symptoms that we sometimes see, the RPLE. These are um, 
are, fortunately those are rare, but they do occur. And, they, and for me, and I think for many clinicians, it's just the having a high index of suspicion that these are potential problems. One of the things we've uh, ferreted out from some of the previous work was that patients who have inflammatory bowel disease or who have bowel obstruction are probably not good candidates to get a drug like bevacizumab uh, because it's been associated with high rates of catastrophic events uh, in those particular settings. Drugs like topotecan um, uh, are also associated with a fair amount of bone marrow suppression. So you would essentially look for that as a toxicity on top of uh, the bevacizumab toxicities if you're looking at them together. Uh, and liposomal doxorubicin can cause a, um, a uh, dose-related uh, uh, unusual side effect we call a hand-foot syndrome. And this is a syndrome where we see rash, uh, dryness, and, and uh, cracking in, this, in the soles of the feet and in the palms of the hands. Um, and uh, in some respects could be exacerbated if they're severe enough uh, with the concomitant use of a, of a drug like bevacizumab. So, so I think, again, that and uh, mouth sores in the form of stomatitis are features that we would just be, want to be careful of and would want to manage prospectively. And, of course, a lot of this comes with uh, prep, prepping the patient so that they come in early uh, when these symptoms start to emerge uh, and that they're comfortable expressing them. Uh, one, one thing we find as uh, clinicians is that patients are sometimes wanting to please us uh, with the regimen. And so I think it's important for um, the patient-physician uh, relationship to be such that these types of symptoms can be brought freely so they can be managed.